Howdy, everyone. Before we get into today's show, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors, Our Crowd and Ledger. Genuinely love both these companies. Proud to call them sponsors of the show. You're going to be hearing all about them from me later. But for now, on with the program. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another weekly roundup edition of On the Margin. I am joined, as always, by my energetic co-host, Mr. Mark Yusko. What's going on, Mark? Ah, good morning, Michael. Good morning. And you know, we got to start off right with the with the sock reveal. I got some good ones. The socks, today. baby. I got some good ones socks. today. It's gonna take it's gonna take some acrobatics to show them to you, but I got some good ones. They are the rest in peace Bitcoin. Wow. So love it. you know, the love death it. of Bitcoin has been proclaimed what four hundred plus times. Uh, still not dead, but uh, I'm wearing my rest yeah. in peace socks today just for the heck of it. Mark, you put me to shame by doing acrobatics. Uh, <laughs> every one of these shows that. Yeah, it would have been great if on Showed tape I fell yard. down and like broke my arm. Or it would have been would have been awesome. Oh yeah, that would have been excellent, and I would have been here being like, uh, Mark, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hello? Hello. Uh, hello, Mark, can I, can I get some help yeah. here? Um, my wife's still here. She really could have come got me. Okay, cool. Um, so I know there are safety procedures in place. Uh, before we get into the charts, um, there was, uh, you know, a pretty big announcement, I guess, a couple of days ago, or not a super big announcement, but I'd love to get your take on it. So Ray Dalio actually came out, pretty famous skeptic of Bitcoin, right? Uh, he's not exactly calling it rat poison squared, but has certainly not been a fan of it. Uh, he came out the other day and actually said that Bitcoin is uh, here to stay. It's a viable alternative mm-hmm. to something like gold and actually admitted to owning some Bitcoin and Ethereum, although he declined to say exactly how, how much, much. Right. I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, I'm curious to say, what's your take uh, on all this? Look, Ray is a, a really smart guy. He's a, he's a you know he's another member of the uh, old guy macro thinkers. I like to put myself in mm-hmm. that group. Not that I'm Ray Dalio, but uh, I am old and I am a macro guy. Uh, so whether it's Dan Moorhead, whether it's Mark uh, Mike Novogratz, you know whether it's John Burbank. Now we got another macro thinker, you know, or Paul Tudor Jones and. And uh, Stan Druckenmiller. So lots of older guys have come around to mm. say, "Yeah, there's something here." And mm. and look, they've they've approached it the way I think everyone, you know, it's my hashtag get off zero, right? Zero is the wrong number. You don't have to put all your money there. Some people do. Um, probably wouldn't do that. But you know, you should definitely have a few percent of you know opt out money. Um, because the fiat fiasco is bad. It's getting worse. Uh, you know, I saw, I don't even know her name, the crazy, the press secretary that, uh, you know, I don't know. She's like a she's like a meme in and of herself. Um, the bright red hair and all this stuff. I, but, saw, I saw this. I saw this too, yeah, yeah, on Twitter. And I mean, just the complete lack of knowledge of economic theory is frightening. Mm. It's just absolutely mm. frightening. And they are going to double down and double down again on this idea that that inflation is good for the little guy, guy and gal, and that printing money out of nowhere is is sport. So uh, I think you have to have some of your wealth, and I think that's what Ray finally came up with. Right? Is is like okay if they're going to steal my purchasing power? Now <laughs> that guy doesn't need to worry about purchasing power. He has lots and lots of money. Although he has put a lot of it in his foundation and, and he's doing a lot of good. So I, I applaud him, but uh, probably doesn't have to worry about the cost of meat um, and the corporate greed of uh, meat producers. I'm like, how about just supply and demand, guys? <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty crazy to see people blaming like, uh, you know, greedy corporations here. I mean, it's, it's wild how that narrative has emerged, uh, to be honest. You know, Old if I could slick my hair back, I would do the Gordon Gecko greed for lack of a better term, is, is good. And, uh, you know, this idea that, that it's the corporation's fault um, that they had to raise prices because they printed 40% of all the money in the history of the Republic. I mean, to, I, I, every time I say that, I, I just want to, I want to laugh, I want to cry. I don't even know what my emotion is. But that is a stunning, stunning number. It's 255 it years. It's a long time. I know. Well, it also gives you a sense of how these things compound on one another, right? And this is, again, this is uh, something that the Bitcoin community has certainly been on top of, which is, you know, when you when your solution to, uh, you know, shortcomings is to print money, eventually, you know, and to use the analogy I've heard you use as well, 
which is it's like uh, you know your body begins to adapt to it, right? It's like and it's like an addict, yeah. and you get used to the hit, and then you need an even bigger hit for it to be for it to work. And um, you know, there's that Mitt Romney quote uh, which he got derided for at the time. It's like a couple billion here, a couple billion there. You're talking about real money, yeah. and now it's a couple trillion here, a couple trillion there. You're starting to talk about real money. And um, again, I I know I say this a lot, and and people think it's dumb, but I don't think it's dumb, right? You and I have to sit here together for 31,710 years. Now, as much as I would enjoy that, most people would find that very unpleasant. Um, we gotta spend a dollar every second. That's one trillion. One, mm. 31,710 years. That's, these numbers aren't real. And mm. at some point, you know, I, I did a presentation yesterday. I kind of went back around the world. You know, I do these monthly around the world things. And uh, we went back around the world and I went through all the old presentations. And I have this one chart. And it's basically a model that predicts the Bitcoin price based on money supply, global money supply. Hmm. And then it shows the Bitcoin price. And it's highly correlated, as you should expect, right? Because... What we're doing yeah. with Bitcoin, I, I, you know, I was out in Florida for the, not Florida, in Vegas, Vegas, uh, for the uh, Real Vision event, you know, the Vegas takeover. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody, everybody talks about Bitcoin, the, the price is rising. I said, remember, one Bitcoin is still one Bitcoin. What we're talking about mm -hmm. is the denominator. If you denominate it in bolivars, the price is astronomical because the bolivar has been totally, you know, devalued. If you denominate it in pesos, it's different. If you denominate in yen, it's different. We always talk about it in dollars. That's the one everybody kind of gravitates toward. And it's not that Bitcoin is necessarily getting better. It's that the US dollar is getting worse and it's getting worse at an accelerating rate. And you see that everywhere yeah. as, as we're going to talk about. Let me, let me ask you a question. Uh, one thing that I'm also noticing as well, which is pretty interesting, is uh, Bitcoin and crypto is becoming, in my view, increasingly politicized. Oh, like man. you can see, crypto start to be Crazy. a bit of a lightning rod issue, and it's and it's in in the U.S. I you know I wish it didn't have to be like this, but I guess this is just like the way of the world, and uh, almost like the way that Bitcoin takes center stage. But you know, it looks like the GOP and the Democrats are kind of they've got their lines right. There are lines being drawn, and it looks like the GOP uh, is coming down in favor uh, of Bitcoin and crypto innovation in the U.S. You got guys like. Ted Cruz mm -hmm. talking about mining mm -hmm. uh, in Texas and stuff like that. And then you've got, you know, Elizabeth Warren gave testimony, you know, to the Financial Services Committee, House Financial Services Committee this week, you know, calling stable coins the sketchiest part of all of crypto. Uh, of and, you know, everyone I mean, in crypto is like laughing at that. She's bought and Because paid it's for. like you're picking the one most legitimate part of, of no, the whole industry. No, that's the problem. Michael, <laughs> that, that is the problem, right? It's it's yeah. not the sketchy stuff that they that they care about. It's the legitimate stuff, right? It's the, the stuff, stuff that, that works. threatens yeah. the banking system. And mm. and look, it cost a hundred million dollars to become a senator, give or take. Mm. Most people don't have a hundred million dollars. So what do they do? Mm. They raise it through fundraisers. And guess what? If someone writes you a check for millions and millions of dollars, you are going to be beholden to them. And that's why I, I want an accounting of the three trillion dollar stimulus bill, and I want to actually know how much goes into stimulus, how much goes into bridges and roads and and buildings. Probably not very much. The bulk of it is mm. going to pay off campaign promises and port projects. And so when Elizabeth Warren, right, who is the banker's best friend, bankster's best friend, says that stable coins are evil. That proves how valuable they are and how good they are. And you know, I heard a great line the other day that I've, I've now co-opted as part of mine, uh, so I don't even remember who to give credit to anymore, uh, that there is no tech in fintech. And fintech's amazing. And fintech has created lots of wealth and you know, Affirm and Chime and, and uh, all these great companies. But there's no tech. They use the mm. old banking rails. That is not mm. technology, right? That is not technological innovation. They got a better UX. They appealed to a marketing group and, and got some, some young people to, to buy in. But it ain't tech. The only tech yeah. is if we go on chain. And things like stable coins, stable coins will, will replace Swift, full stop. Yeah. And it's T instant is better than T plus two. 
just is. T yeah. instant at zero cost is better than seven different systems saying, oh, I need a piece of this, I need a piece of that. And um, you know, one of our portfolio companies, Figure Technologies, Mike Cagney, has a new T instant payment system using mm -hmm. not the old rails, but the new rails. It could be big. I mean, it could be really big. And yeah. so that's why she's gonna fight it and she's gonna fight really hard and that's okay. I yeah, it's just you know, to me it's so disappointing that it has to be like that. I I mean there is the the whole bought and paid for thing, but it is funny too. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, to be cynical on the other side of the same coin, which is like, why is the GOP embracing this? It's probably because they found out, right, that there's a huge engaged community here and it'll be good for their voter base and stuff like that. So, you know, the cynical side is not maybe necessarily that they're like seeing the future here, but it's like yeah. There's a cynical it's, side to no, that no, no, as no. well. It's 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 absolutely not um, meritorious, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. or benevolent. It's definitely self interested. So why does Ted mm -hmm. Cruz care? Well, because a whole bunch of people moved a lot of money, like real money, like hundreds of millions of dollars, into mm -hmm. his state and district, and started right. doing a really cool thing, reducing yeah, our right. carbon footprint by capturing flared gas which is horrible for the environment, and converting energy to value, right? It's one of the greatest mm. things ever, really. I mean, I, look, I'm prone to hyperbole, but it actually is really cool that you can convert waste gas that is absolutely polluting the environment and polluting the landscape and is ugly and an eyesore and a blight and yeah. turn it into this great thing. And the best part is I don't need pipelines. I don't need transmission wires. I can transfer it anywhere. The amazing thing about a Bitcoin or, or an Ethereum or any, any other token is you take this, this nebulous energy, electricity, whatever it is, and you use an algorithm and bam, you're compressing it into this immutable, transferable, and it's not physical, right? It's not like a gold coin. Um, I always laugh about that, right? When I always sew Bitcoin, like even on my socks, it's a gold coin. Like, but there's no gold and there's no coins. I don't really understand that. But uh, um, so I, I, I now it's also, I think, a little bit of luck. Right. Um, Caitlin was from Wyoming. And Caitlin Long could have been from anywhere, but she happened to be from Wyoming. Actually, uh, I just did a really awesome interview with her for uh, Real Vision. And it, it's going to be awesome. Um, I mean, we talked for an hour and 15 minutes. I could talk for 10 hours. But, you know, she went back home to Wyoming and worked with legislators to get the laws passed that were needed to make it a crypto-friendly environment. And, you know, maybe Cynthia Lummis paid attention to her. Maybe it was something else. But my guess is that she paid attention and, you know, she happens to be a Republican. Now, maybe there's something else more to it. Maybe I can give her more credit than, hey, in my state, there's this cool activity going on, so I should get behind it. Uh, maybe she actually did have an epiphany that this is you know, real money. Um, yeah. but I think there's a little bit of that serendipity. But your point is, I think, the, the one, right? Most of the people in this business are young. That's why I love it, because it keeps me young to hang around people like you, young, smart people. Um, and that voter base, I won't say it's a one-issue Although people are trying to make it a one issue thing and you know, only vote for people who are crypto friendly. Okay. Define crypto friendly. What does that exactly mean? Um, so it is complex and I wish it weren't partisan. Although it is weird that it's gone partisan because, you know, the biggest donor to the, or second biggest donor to the democratic party was SBF. I mean, hmm. that's seems like they wouldn't turn their back on that, but yeah. No, it's it's really interesting. I I mean, maybe in in um, in a funny way, you know, crypto's ascendancy. You know, this was this is always the this is always the the predetermined outcome of what happens when something becomes big enough. It eventually becomes politicized, and you know, the underlying message gets uh, corrupted or, or lost uh, in some important way. And that's just the result of us all being human beings and imperfect. And, and yeah, and there's another piece uh, that is less good, right? Which is. Hmm. When people have success in a particular area, particularly venture capitalists in a certain area, um, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, then have political aspirations of their own and, and want to influence, peddle, and 
And so that happened in the tech bubble. And you had a whole bunch of people pushing the Democrats to do certain things. And, and one could argue, right? You know, I, I used to make the joke all the time, like everybody else, that you know, Al Gore did not invent the internet. And then I heard someone talk mm. this weekend who's, who made a very interesting point and said, yeah, you're right. You know, it was Tim Berners-Lee and Vint Cerf, but without Al Gore and his leadership of, I can't remember the actual bill, but there was a bill that basically took down some of the barriers that were trying to be erected to the internet, you know, by the incumbents. And that was, that was a really good point that it mm. was through lobbying, you know, some of the wealthy venture capitalists that were on the Democratic side, lobbying Al and others uh, to, to get that pushed. And, and the same thing happened with net neutrality laws and the same thing will happen with, with Bitcoin. So it is inevitable, uh, unfortunately. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I want to make sure that we get to uh, some of yeah, our did charts we have here. Something we are supposed to do this uh, morning. I mean, yeah, I know. Yeah, dude, I know. I know. Seriously, and... I know. Chit chatting away. Everyone's like, "Get us the charts, guys." Um, all right, let me pull this up here. Um, all right. Um, so this is one that we actually got uh, tagged in on Twitter. Um, so shout out. Uh, Darn, I'm blanking on your name right now. I'll link in the show notes. Uh, but we're looking at uh, NASDAQ breadth. Um, and this comes to us from uh, Tavi Costa, who puts together so many Tavi is so great. Um, I mean, awesome. And Kevin mm -hmm. is so great. I mean, they, anyone who doesn't mm -hmm. have money with those guys is missing it. I mean, they are spectacular mm -hmm. macro investors. Again, macro. Macro is king. Um, yeah. Old macro guys. I, I love this chart, right? Um, mm -hmm. And again, I am not a statistician. I did fine in stats, but not really a statistician. I'm here to tell you, the left-hand side of that chart, the left two-thirds of that chart, is a very high correlation. Mm -hmm. Right? I, you know, is it 98? Is it 99? I don't know. It's a very high correlation. And something obviously changed. Okay. So what was it that changed? There's a whole bunch of things that changed. But uh, this is what I refer to as alligator jaws. And I even have a hashtag for that, of course, right? Alligator jaws always close. It mm. is impossible that this uh, correlation will be suspended forever. Um, you, know, you can suspend disbelief for a short period of time, and, and that's fine. But you can't you can't suspend it forever. And uh, so, and I have a, I have another one that you know, breath is death for bear, for bull market. Mm. Lack of breath is death for bull markets. So this is telling us that, you know, when people are afraid, right? So this is a little bit of Omicron. It's a little bit of, um, you know, growth slowing. When people are afraid, they tend to pour money into familiar. And that's the FANG stocks. And yep. everything else is finally learning about gravity. And uh, I, think I've, I think I've told this, that the, you know, the, the story of the guy who, uh, Bill Cosby had this bit about this kid who could ride his bike anywhere, like over the swing set, and do circles, and he never fell until someone told him about gravity. So some companies, and it's like the cloud companies, right? The cloud companies were selling it stupid valuations. I mean, stupid, 40, 50 times sales. And uh, now they're not. And they went down 40% fast. And there's probably another 40 or 50% to go in some of these cases. And this is, you know, my old wrestling coach, right? Where the head goes, the body follows. So you want someone yeah. to move, push their head one way, the body will follow. So uh, the rest of the market is poised for a meaningful catch down. Yeah. And for those of you who aren't uh, following here on video, what we're looking at is uh, we're looking at the last price of the NASDAQ and we're looking at the percent of members above their 200 day moving average. So there's a really high correlation between what the what the Nasdaq is overall doing and the amount of folks that are, are companies that are in the Nasdaq that are above their 200 day moving average. What we've recently seen is a huge departure from the norm where the you know the percentage of companies above their 200 day moving average is, is plummeting while the price of the Nasdaq is keeping on moving up. Um, and you know to me I mean I guess th this is kind of the story of the last however many years overall in you know, for major indices, stock indices in the U.S., you know, when you look at even the S&P and the concentration among the top, like, 10 companies there, 
you know, you know, when people are saying why, you know, th there was this narrative back in when COVID, uh, you know, was first hitting and people were like, why is the stock market doing so well? Um, you know, when when the entire country is being shut down, it's like, you know, on the one hand, you could look at it and say, well, it's all this money that the government is printing. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of legitimacy to that. But you could also look at it and say, well, you know, the companies that comprise, you know, the vast majority of the stock market and drive the index, um, they're technology based companies. Right. And they've become these kind of safe haven companies in a way, because you look at something like Apple, right, or Google, and it's like, well, or Amazon, and these companies are going to kind of do well, no matter what. Um, and so I guess when I look at this chart, that's kind of what I'm seeing. It's here, definitely right? those mega cap definitely tech companies continuing to do well. Definitely an important part of it, Michael. I mean, really important part of it. But there is another, again, less mm -hmm good and more sinister. I always love the sinister mm. stat, sinister Saturday sinister Saturday uh, piece. But there's a more sinister point, which is, look, 1986, a bunch of people from the mutual fund industry went to Washington and paid a bunch of money to get the Tax Act of 86 passed, which had nothing to do with taxes. And it basically changed our entire retirement system from defined benefit where the company provided for your retirement with a defined benefit, they gave you a certain amount of money when you retired, to define contribution. Now, the, the pitch was, oh, well, this will be so good for the employees because they'll be in charge of their financial future and it'll be portable. They can take their 401k with them. That had nothing to do with it. The average person, mm. and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but the average person has no business managing their own money. They don't have time, they don't have knowledge, they don't have interest. It should be managed by a professional, the professional money manager at the pension. And that would be a better system. It had everything to do with, by doing this, it allowed companies to cut their pension contribution by 30%. 30%, right, right to the bottom line. And so that's why corporate profits started to rise and help with the bull market. But what it really did is it siphoned money every two weeks. Every two weeks, like clockwork, money is going into passive indices, mutual funds. Mm. And by doing so, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that you must buy more. See, index funds are dumb, meaning they can't think. They must buy more, regardless of valuation. And so what it does, it exacerbates bubbles and when it's fueled by free money, you get this craziness. Like Apple is a $3 trillion market cap company. That's insane. It's insane. Its growth rate sense. is slowing. Its profits are the same today. It's net income, same today as they were in 2015. The only reason mm -hmm. earnings per share goes up is because they've bought back stock by issuing debt and buying back shares, just financial engineering to pay Warren Buffett big dividends. So. It's, ah, there you go. Look at, look how smart you are. It's incredible. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it is interesting. I mean, this did get pointed out, uh, you know, Jesse Felder, you tweeted these two things together. When you look at um, stock buybacks, uh, so we're, we're at a record, right? Um, in Q3 of 2021, you know, there was like $265 billion worth of stock buybacks. Um, and at the same time, there's a record uh, $69 billion worth of stock uh, being sold by corporate insiders. So this, so this is the biggest scam of the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Absolute biggest. Again, prone to hyperbole. Yeah. But this this is not hyperbole. This, is, this was engineered by the previous administration, the corporate tax cut, and it was basically a quid pro quo. It's like, here's the deal, mm -hmm. guys. Warren bought a bunch of big stocks and people say, why did Warren Buffett all of a sudden buy tech stocks? Oh, let's, let's discuss this because, okay. Why did he finally buy Amazon after it was up a gazillion percent? Why did he finally buy Apple after it was up a gazillion percent? Because what Warren does is he buys low volatility assets that pay a dividend and he levers them up with negative cost of capital money from his insurance company in a tax deferred strategy. So it has nothing to do with value investing. I mean, he's this old folksy grandpa, great value investor. No, he is a financial. He's, like, he's got the best PR. He's the financial ever. engineer. Um, I mean, look into his real personal life about his wife and his kids and about, oh, it's who you um, But look, he is a genius. I'm not, I'm not saying he's not a genius. He is a genius, but he's a political machine. He engineered this whole thing through money. Uh, like, why did he get the call during the global financial crisis to bail out Bank of America and, and Goldman Sachs? Why, why, why did he get that call? I don't know. 
The Halo, you baby. Paid for it. The, the Warren Buffett Halo. Yeah. No, it's because you paid for it. Why did the XL pipeline get canceled recently? Because Warren likes mm. his tanker cars full of oil to, to travel. But this is this crazy. So what what Trump administration did is said, here's the deal. We will cut your taxes okay, for the 0.1%. Forget the rest of you guys. We're going to cut the taxes because I'm one of the 0.1%. I'm going to cut my taxes and all your rich people taxes. We're going to do it through the corporation. But here's the, here's the quid pro quo. You must take that money and buy back your stock. So this was stealth QE. They couldn't do any more QE because mm -hmm. they were tapped out. This was stealth QE. And then the insiders were allowed to sell into it. And look, insiders don't sell at bottoms. Think about it. If you and I are in, you know, in the market and we're trying to buy something and we're up against an insider, who has more information? Definitionally, they have more information. Would they be selling if they thought the stock was undervalued? No. Mm. So. Well, uh, yeah, and to support that point, actually, um, well, a couple of thoughts when I look at this chart. So one, you know, w the implication here, at least, you know, in these tweets, what, what you don't know is you don't know which companies um, are buying back their stocks and which insiders are selling, mm -hmm. right? So the implication here is that insiders are selling their own stock to their company. To themselves. Buying it back. Yeah. Right, right. I'm not 100 percent sure that's the case, that's but a little it, bit it does it. look like it's that in some cases. Not zero. And you know, to your point, insiders do tend to be smart sellers of stock, and buy, and company buybacks do tend to happen at like the worst possible times. Always, um, uh, companies tend to be not great buyers of their own stock. Um, to be honest, so yeah, I mean, to me overall, when I look at these two things together. It just kind of screams that the market at least thinks that stocks are expensive right now. And certainly when you look at historical valuations, I mean, it's hard not to come away with that conclusion as well. Look, this, this, so, is all, this, this has been the plan all along. And, you know, it's funny. I don't know. People just kind of ignore long-term plans, right? They ignore mm. the fact that the Fed was created right, to steal wealth through inflation. It's theft. Inflation is theft. Mm. Um, and we perpetuated this myth, you know, back to the White House press secretary. She was trying to say that you know, inflation is really good for the little guy. Are, are you out of your mind? I mean, yeah, craziness. One one thing that I, you know, would I'm really would like to push back on as well is it's it's funny. Something interesting is starting to happen with uh, mainstream media outlets that I'm seeing, which is this co-opting of this narrative that uh, inflation is actually not a bad thing. And inflation can be positive for the little guy, et cetera. And, you know, I one thing that seems a little sinister to me in general is when, you know, good good media is when, you know, media is supposed to hold truth to power, right? Accountability to power. They're supposed to challenge, um, you know, narratives that are coming out of, you know, political institutions or government administrations or whatever. That's why everyone hates the media. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like right now, mainstream outlets are increasingly becoming a mouthpiece of the state and state interest and pushing state narratives. And I would say that's dangerous. Oh, I'd say that's dangerous. Incredibly so I think dangerous. it's important to call that out when you see it. No, incredibly um, dangerous. And, and look, we've talked about this, right? The, in the olden, olden, olden days, the church was the state, right? The church was the power. Mm -hmm. And you went to church on Sunday and, or Saturday and you got told what to think. You got told the news, you got told the, the, the view, because you didn't read or write, you know, you were a serf or a peasant, and that's the way it worked. And the printing press literally yeah. broke that monopoly, because now you could actually print stuff. Now a lot of people couldn't read it, but you could have someone tell you the story, or tell you, and you could gather not in church, but in a town square, and someone could read to you what was, what was going on. They could pass you a book, and you could understand. And so what happened is the governments co-opted that role, and the whole thing about separation of church and state, right? We left the church, you know, the pilgrims went over here to, to mm. and they created their own version of the, the church through the state. And, you know, it was actually, as much as I love the founders and the framers, there's a little bit of, hey, this is, we're, we're, we know what's right for everybody. So us, us old white guys will we'll take care of everything. And, uh, mm. So governments control the media, and it's still to this day, right? We have state-owned media in many countries. Uh, and, you know, for ABC, NBC, CBS, for years, that was where you got your news, right? You sat down in front of the news at 6 o'clock, 
and you watched Walter Cronkite and he told you what to think and how to believe. And But to your point, there was a standard, I believe, in those early days of, of journalism is seeking truth, right? Fair and mm -hmm. balanced. And uh, now that's just a comedy, right? Because now I agree with you that, that state interests have kind of wrested control back through money uh, to, to have narratives pitched. And it's now about eyeballs and clicks. And, and it's because the internet broke the monopoly that the government's had on information. And so now we get our information yeah. from all these other sources but because of the centralization, which is why I'm such a big fan of decentralization, because of centralization, mm -hmm. we've now got these echo chambers and we've got these bots that, you know, give us misinformation or I shouldn't even say misinformation, just information that supports our view and counterdicts, you know, what we should actually be doing in terms of discourse and dialogue and debate in search of truth, to your point. So you look around the world, the, the statization, made up a word there, of media, absolutely increasing. Mm. I agree with you 100%. Such a great insight. Yeah. When it comes to crypto, security and custody is paramount. Introducing this episode's sponsor, Ledger, your secure gateway to buy, exchange, and grow your crypto assets. I know I've got a smart audience, so I'm assuming slash hoping that most of you already have your Ledger hardware wallet, but just in case you don't, this is how I think about it. I wouldn't get into a car if I couldn't wear a seatbelt, and I don't operate in crypto unless I can do it for my Ledger hardware wallet. Crypto is really exciting, but it is still the Wild West. There are lots of risks, and Ledger is the easiest way to make sure that you are still protected. And the best part about Ledger is that you don't need to make any trade-offs between security of your funds and utility of your assets because Ledger has Ledger Live, which is a software that syncs right up to your Ledger hardware wallet, and you can do anything that you'd want to do with your crypto assets. You can easily send and receive, you can buy and exchange, and you can get access to staking. And they've actually started to aggregate some of the best DeFi apps and services out there. Two of my favorites, Paraswap, a decentralized aggregator, and they've got Lido for staking. And stay tuned, I'm going to keep you guys updated. They've got some really cool services uh, coming out soon. Ave, Compound, and One Inch among them. So if you take one thing away from this, guys, please, please, please make sure that you're protected in this space. Get yourself a Ledger hardware wallet today and start using the Ledger Live app. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Thank me later. All around the world, tech companies are innovating and driving returns for investors. Our crowd takes a global bird's eye view of private markets and brings the companies with the greatest growth potential to you to invest in. One of my favorite quotes from Jim Bianco is when he says, I hate it when people tell me to invest like Warren Buffett. I wish I could invest like that guy. He sees all the best deals. Well, our crowd is addressing exactly that issue by bringing private companies to you when you can take advantage of them, i.e. when they're still early. Our crowd's accredited investors have already invested over $1 billion in growing tech companies, and many have benefited from the 46 uh, IPOs or otherwise sale exits that they've experienced on the platform. Join the fastest growing venture capital investment community at ourcrowd.com slash OTM. Again, that is ourcrowd.com slash OTM. If you take one thing away from this, be it that you should include OTM when you join our crowd. We'll see you soon. I agree. It's uh, and uh, we'll return to that uh, thought with one chart later on here. But um, the you know the other connection that I wanted to make uh, before we kind of moved on from this, just in general, is you know one of the other kind of concerning connections, right, between what's going on with the stock market uh, in general and just the kind of general well-being of the United States uh, is you know when when you take a look at the correlation in between uh, people's net worth and what's going on with um, the S and P five hundred. So. You know, this was a, a a series of charts that got tweeted out by Zero Hedge, um, and for me, it was it was pretty interesting actually. So you're looking at you know in the top left there, you're looking at consumer net worth versus the S and P 500, right, which are super super correlated, um, and you're looking at net worth as a percentage of income as well, which is continuing to go up and up and up. Um, so you know, overall, what's what's kind of interesting to me about these two charts on the left is that. You know, this almost flies in the face a little bit of that narrative that you hear, which is what income inequality is being generated by, you know, central banks debasing the currency. It's good for financial assets. Who owns financial assets? The top 1%. Mm -hmm. But honestly, you know, if you look at a lot of the charts coming out of the pandemic in general, 
you know, you do actually see even the bottom echelons of, uh, you know, the income demographic, they're going up as well, which I, uh, I mean, money I don't know. Illusion, what, Michael. Your... Oh, come on. Don't get fooled by money illusion. Uh, mm. This is in nominal terms. This is not in real terms. And, and, mm. and, it's, and it's a cap weighting problem. It's like the S&P itself, right? The S&P doesn't really go up. It's the top names that mm. go up because it's self-perpetuating. Every time someone buys an S&P 500 index, they got to buy now four and a half or five percent of Apple. That's silly, right? That, that it should be you should be buying less as something becomes overvalued and buying more of the thing. That's how re, rebalancing, and yeah. the index and cap weighting is a momentum strategy, and momentum strategies mm. are fantastic in high liquidity environments. That's how they work, but value investors should be rotating from those highly overvalued sectors into the undervalued sectors. And same thing's true here is you got these if you if you stratify this into the top 0.1%, top 1%, top 10%, bottom 50%, what you see is there's been very little growth in net worth for it's not zero to your point, it's not zero, but very little growth in that bottom echelon. And and the growth rate is is not a, a 30 degree line, it's like a 75 degree line for the tippy top. And that's because it's concentrated. The statistics on net worth are cap weighted, right? They don't, they don't say, you know, my net worth is the same as Jeff's net worth in calculating. It's, you know, his like 10 gazillion times more than mine. And right. so the, it's like my, one of my first bosses had this great line, figures lie and liars figure. And, you know, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess. And, well, I, I, I actually agree with you that there is there is some light in this tunnel here, that there is some evidence that other people's wealth, everyone's wealth is rising a little bit. But again, I think it's, it's an oncoming train because I think it is true money illusion. Yes, the house, if you're lucky enough to, many people don't, they rent. So they, they rent their house, they rent their, their apartment. They don't have any savings. They don't have any stocks. They don't have any income producing real estate. They get by paycheck to paycheck, right? What is it? The average person can't come up with $400 for an emergency. That's a frightening thought. I mean, $400 is not a lot of money. Uh, so that is troubling because what's happening is maybe your net worth is a little bit higher because the, the, interest rate on your student loans and the interest rate on your mortgage is down. So your monthly payments are down. So you've made a little progress, but then go to the store and try to buy something. And that stealth tax of inflation is not measured in all of this data that they show because they use nominal numbers. Hmm. I, you know, I just, just thinking of something as you were, uh, as you were talking there, Maybe this is going to sound crazy and like zooming way, way out here, but um, I'm almost because I'm starting to look more at like market dynamics that are going on in crypto. And uh, I think most of the growth in crypto is actually being driven by something that you could categorize as something like money illusion, mm -hmm. which I know would be heresy for a lot of <laughs> people. But generally, right. I feel like I, I feel like what ends up happening in crypto is like the core money, Bitcoin and more recently ETH go up. And then that leads to investment in other things, right? Like it was ICOs in 2017. Now it's, so I'm not comparing NFTs and ICOs or DeFi. And oh, I, I think ICOs were, but whatever. So the, it leads to investment in other things, which starts off as kind of scammy and bubbly, eventually become very, very legitimate. Um, but, it, but it starts with that idea of money illusion. And I guess what my question would be is like, isn't all growth kind of driven by money illusion, because at the end of the day, what yeah. we're just trying to yeah. do as human yes, beings but, is coordinate. Yes, but it's a, again, it's, I, I love right. talking to you. Um, no, I mean it's just it's. I mean, I, I just I rarely get to talk to people who actually think. Um, if you ask people their opinion, you know, most people mm. will parrot back something that they heard from someone else. They don't actually mm. step back <clears throat> and think about it. But you mm. are incredibly thoughtful in that you take in information and you actually take time to think about it and formulate a view or a question. And that is very refreshing and much fun. Uh, thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. I, I feel like I, I'll go off on these tangents all the time, but like at the end of the day, like 
I'm just very curious about this. Like the, what I was going to ask you is, you know, a, a hypothetical question, right? Let's say 2000 years ago, there was a lot less value in the world, right? We don't have, there weren't like publicly traded companies or whatever back then. There were just kind of these weird city mm -hmm. states and what, let me ask, hypothetical question. Has value been created between now and then? Like, yes. Is there and, more and value in the world? Yes. And here's, here's what it is. Mm. Innovation. Mm. You're absolutely right that the much of growth comes mm. from the creation of money. And I will make the statement again, which will piss off all the libertarians and all the, the, the true maxis that fractional reserve banking is one of the great inventions of all time, full mm. stop. And Caitlin's mad at me for saying that. And, you know, cause rehypothecation is, is evil. No, it's not. No, it is not. If I can take a dollar and deposit in an institution, lend out 90% of that, you borrow that 90%, deposit it in your institution, and then they lend out 81 cents and so on and so forth, that creates opportunity, but it creates no value unless people innovate, build businesses, create new technology, create new consumer services, and so it's that conversion of energy to value that is actually creating the value. So what crypto is, in my mind, the reason I'm spending so much time on it, is this innovation cycle where we are now making value bidirectional. And that is mm. massive wealth creation opportunity. And so mm. I agree with you that so much of any growth is money illusion, right? Just money mm. supply growth and debt, right? Debt makes us all believe that we're wealthier than we are. But without innovation, none of it matters. Because if you look around the world, there are plenty of countries have more natural resources, have more, you know, have plenty of smart people, um, but they didn't have a good fractional reserve banking system. So they didn't have the ability to go to the bank, take a loan, start a business, create the innovation that they had in their brain, you know, harness the natural resources. Um, some of it because there were bad dictators in those places taking all the good stuff. Um, part of it because they didn't have good rule of law. That is another, another serious part of the equation is English common law. And the whole British yep. empire, you know, colonization, maybe not such the best thing in the world. However, what it left behind was a system of law. Like, I really like yeah. this fact that as we're sitting here talking, at least for now, I don't have to worry that someone with a bigger gun is going to come take my stuff. Agreed. So I've got to wrap it here a little bit early this week, unfortunately, but um, it's been a ton of fun. We'll get back to this uh, high level discussion of value creation and uh, money illusion uh, next week. But, awesome. Um, been a ton of fun as always, and uh, I will see you same time. All right. Thanks, Michael. Have a good one. All right. Cheers, my friend.